Already shalom and welcome everybody to Brutal Planet right here on your local radio affiliate as well as on Yeshiva Radio as well as on iTunes, on Vimeo and um, YouTube as well. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with each and every single one of you here today as we end up uh, discussing uh, something that is sadly not discussed often, if even at all, within the Lapid Jewish or the Messianic or the Hebrew roots face. And we are going to be discussing this here today, a concept that it is that many of you have probably never heard of, which is something called Mashiach's Sedua. This is something that it is that you would think believers in Yeshua would be leading the way in terms of speaking of this particular time, this, uh, this particular premise, but yet it seems that Chabad and Breslev talk about it ten times more than those within the face that it is that I have just mentioned. And so we are going to be discussing this here today. Now, what is Mashiach's Sedua, the, the meal of Messiah? What is this concept? Those who are uh, not privy to this information and to this concept who have not studied uh, the history of the Baal Shem Tov, nor that of uh, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, also known as the Lavavitcher Rebbe, or that of Rebbe Nachman of Breslev, uh, do not know or have never heard of this premise before. And we are going to be discussing this here today with some amazing revelations that it is that you may be hearing for the very first time. Now, the concept of Mashiach Sadua, the meal of the Messiah, is uh, something that was started by that of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, why did the Baal Shem Tov start this? Because of the fact that he started to realize that upon that of our daily readings that we have during the times of Pesach, each and every single day we have a daily reading through the days of Pesach. And through those, it starts to talk about at the beginning of those readings, the redemption from that of Egypt. But then, in the latter part, in the end part of that of the readings, um, in the last couple of days of Pesach, deal with the ultimate Geula. Geula is the Hebrew word for that of redemption. The plural form is Geulot. Now the thing is that a majority of these uh, of the things that are read in the latter days of that of Pesach are within the book of Yeshayahu, the book of Isaiah. Concepts that deal with that of the coming of of the Messiah. And so, therefore, the Baal Shem Tov then decided on the eighth day of Pesach, in terms of closing out Pesach, he says, this is the Sedua of Mashiach. And much like the Haggadah, at the first two days of that of Pesach, we also have a meal. And some of the very same things. The four cups of wine, as well as the matzah, is also used within that of the Sedua of Mashiach. And so, 
there are some things that it is that we should understand that sadly it is that we don't. It's very interesting that this time is known in Judaism to be the door. Okay, this is this is this this marks the day where where it is said to be the door where things ultimately change but at the same time it's a change in terms of growth as we come out of pesach we go through this the seven days of eating matzahs and through that of eating matzahs and not having the the, the leavening there's a change that is within us during that time. And there is a time in where it is that we increase within that of our Torah learning because we have the daily readings as opposed to the weekly readings. And so there is something that is spiritually um, that elevates us to a higher mandrega during the time of Pesach. So therefore, this is why it is called the door. Another reason why it is called the door is because the fact that uh, if any of you go and get like some of these commentaries that it is that I do, like for instance, the uh, uh, the Or HaChaim commentary is is a prime example of this. Um, each book of the Torah is divided into two books because there's so just so much commentary, and it's very interesting that in in this set alone, you know, they haven't released all of the books, but however, right now. We are. We have just finished the first book of that of uh, of Leviticus. We're getting ready to start on over. So essentially, this right here is ending the fifth book in the series. Okay. So the reason why this is significant is because of the fact we have five books on one side and five books on the other, and so upon that. One of the things that we ultimately end up seeing from last week's Parshas, and if we are in a leap year, which we are this year, um, then we have one Parshas, and then we go into to another one two weeks later after that of Pesach. But if we're not in a leap year, then we have two Torah portions, Tazria and Metzorah, the week before that of Pesach. And then we have Acharimot and Kedoshim, after that of Pesach, okay? So this is, there's a reason for this, okay? And it all ties together, and I'm going to show you why. First of all, when we look at the, 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 the Torah portion, Metzorah, and if we tie in uh, Tazria as well, the thing that we see ended up being discussed there is this concept of Negesorot. We have all of this negative stuff that happens. Negesorot that brings about that of Metzorah, that brings about leprosy. Okay, and we get into concepts such as Lashon Hara, and we have this time within that of the biblical narrative during those Torah portions that deal with, you know, affliction, that deal with things, you know, uh, that is a negative consequence to the children of Israel, is what we see there. But then, when we get into Acharimot, the thing that's interesting there is that the main thing that's talked about is the garments of the priest and the whole things, all the things that deal with that of Yom Kippur. Why it is that we dress in white during the time of Yom Kippur. The th and Yom Kippur deals with that of a spiritual renewal through the times of Teshuva between that of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and us hopefully coming out on the good side of the Book of Life as soon as the door or the gates are closed. Okay, so we end up seeing how it is that this time that's right in between the Torah portion readings act like a door. It goes from a negative to that of a positive. Okay, it, it goes with the filthiness of that of the children of Israel through that of Negesorot and Metzorah. And then we have the concept of renewal through that of wearing white during the time of the Yom Kippur service. And it's also very interesting that considering this premise as well, we see that within the Basorot, within the Gospels, Mashiach himself 
refers to himself as the delet. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with some uh, uh, Hebrew misconceptions here. That's gonna help you to understand this. A lot of people who don't know Hebrew try and say that Hebrew is a picture language. It's not a picture language. Okay. Now you heard me say that Yeshua said that he is the delet, and I'm gonna tell you what it is that that word means here in just a moment. But where we get where we get this concept from is that if we spell out the word Dalit, it's the letter Dalit, the letter Lamed, and the letter Tav. Okay, spells the word Dalit. Now the thing is, in order to have it, you know, fully spelled Dalit, underneath the Dalit itself, we have to have a Kamatz. It's like a little line right there, and then under that of the Lamed, we have to have a Segol. So the goal is three little dots and kind of an upside down triangle. Okay. And that brings the word Dalit. Now, the thing is that if we switch up the Nakud, because, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, because many people say the Dalit is a picture of a door. Okay. It's not a picture, but you get the concept of door by that of changing around the Nakud using the same letters, but you switch up the Nakud. Okay. We go and we take the kamatz that is underneath the dalit, and we replace that with another segol. Okay, the three little dots in, in in kind of a triangle shape upside down. You have that underneath, then you get the word delet, which is the word door. This is where these concepts come from. It's not a, it's not a picture language. You know when you you know people say well the word uh, uh, bait is house uh, you know and all that stuff. No, you switch up the nakud, you get bait, which is house. Yod, meaning hand, you know, people say it's a picture of a hand. It's not a picture of a hand. You could take the, you could change up the Nakud for the word Yod and make it Yod, which is the word for hand. And this is the same with all of the letters in that of the, uh, of the Hebrew language. But this concept here, we see the Mashiach himself goes and says, I am the Delet, the door and so let's look at, the, at this concept of the door at, during this time, the two weeks in between that of the Torah portion readings while it is that we are doing the seven days of matzahs, okay? During this time, there is a change that is within us. There's a change within that of our eating habits, we are eating matzahs. We are not having the leaven. The leavening represents what? The leavening represents sin. Okay? And so, therefore, we are leaving Egypt. Essentially, during this time of the year, we are leaving Egypt and not eating, you know, things that are leavened. <coughs> so, with this premise, we see this premise that when a person goes and accepts Yeshua as Mashiach within that of their life, it goes and it says within within the scripture, within that of uh, of the of Sefer Ge'elot, the book of Revelation, it goes and talks about how it is that we put to death the old man, the old ways of ourself. We have put those things to death. The things that have caused us to have this blockage between us and that of God. We go and we put those things to rest. Those things are dead now. We go and bury the old man, as it says. And so we go and we do that. And then, we then ultimately try and, and do everything that is that we can through the leading of Ruach HaKodesh to go and to walk within that through that of Ruach HaKodesh. Okay, we try and to reach the uh, the phase of righteousness. Now, it's very interesting because the word for righteous, okay, is the word tzedek. But righteousness also can be within that of the concept of kadosh, of holiness, okay? And so the thing that's interesting is that the, uh, the word acharimot, Okay, which if we had a double double portion this coming week, then we would have Akharimot and the Torah portion Kedoshim. 
Okay, now I don't know if you realize how significant this is. Because the word Kedoshim deals with holiness. And Akarimot means after death. Okay? And so we have this concept of Akarimot and Kedoshim that are found within that of the book of Revelation that deals with the ultimate Geulah. Okay? And so this is why language is so important in terms of this concept. Not only this, but again, Parshas Ahorimot deals with that of the priest, and why it is that we wear white during, during Yom Kippur. And we see that within the, uh, within the Basarot, when Mashiach comes, comes and is resurrected, we see that he is dressed in white, which deals with that of the premise of that is or that is spoken about in terms of Yom Kippur in the Torah portion, Akharimot. Okay, so you see how all of these things are tied together. Now, the thing is that many of you will say in terms of this that you know, Christopher, you really can't take much stock into this because of the fact that you even said yourself that Mashiach Sedua, the meal of Messiah, was enacted by that of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, the Baal Shem Tov was around during the 1700s, okay? He wasn't, you know, around during the times of Yeshua, before Yeshua, or even during the times of that of Rabbi Akiva, you know. He was after, you know, Rashi and the Rambam and the Yorchaim and Rabbeinu Bakia and the Maharal. You know, all of these guys, he was way after all of them. So, you know, how, so, so we can look at this concept of that the Baal Shem Tov had started and say, that's a new concept. That has nothing to do with ancient biblical narrative because it was something that was enacted by that of the Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> now, the thing is that, you know, I, 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 I cannot go and just say, you know, that you don't know what you're talking about here, but I will say this. Here's one of the things that I've been teaching for several years now. And it's a concept that I see has now started to really gain ground within that of the biblical face. About seven or eight years ago, uh, ago, when I started to believe that Yeshua had taught Hasidic Judaism before Hasidic Judaism even had a title, people told me I was out of my mind. They said, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> You, you can't say that because the Baal Shem Tov started Hasidic Judaism. You know, that's a, that's a very modern thing. How, how can you say that he taught Hasidus? You know, and I, and I was reading a lot of the Baal Shem Tov. I was reading a lot of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev and uh, some of Reb, Rabbi Schneerson's works and all this stuff. And so, you know, the thing about it, those people had, you know, really worked against me. Then a couple of years later, I go and I release the Rabbinic Gospel of Mark. And upon doing that, you know, and for those who don't know what the Rabbinic Gospel of Mark is, many of you are familiar with, you know, the various Chomashim that we have here, and how it is that Chomashim go and incorporate a ton of footnotes in, you know, to, to, to help you with the Rabbinic commentary in terms of, the, of all of these things. And when I wrote the Rabbinic Gospel of Mark, or not really a wrote, assembled the Rabbinic Gospel of Mark, you know, it was because of the reason I was saying there's so many rabbinic parallels here that, you know, and nobody has put together a work that shows all the rabbinic parallels and the things that it is that Yeshua himself was quoting. And so I ended up going and putting that thing together. And then within a couple of months, people are, people are using it within that of Messianic yeshivas. They're using it within seminaries, you know, and all this stuff. And now the concept that I have been speaking about for many years of Yeshua teaching Hasidic Judaism before Hasidic Judaism was even a thing is now vastly accepted. And we see a lot of people now coming through the woodwork saying the exact same thing. And this deals a great deal with the final Geulot as well. Because basically one of the things that we see is that Daniel goes and tells us that in the end days, knowledge will increase. 
Now, the thing about those, we can look around and say, knowledge isn't really increasing that much, in all honesty, because we have people that, you know, I mean, if you go and you look on social media, people can't spell anymore. You know, kids are getting dumb, you know. Uh, basic things that it is, they, the you and I, you know, learned as kids and all that stuff, and we're able to grasp ahead. You know, we have high schoolers that are not even able to, you know, to grasp basic concepts and all this stuff. You know, I'm working on my third college degree right now. And I'm telling you right now, the education system is so incredibly dumbed down. So, you know, how is it that we could say knowledge is increasing? Some people would say, well, wait a minute, that is true. But look at, you know, at the same time, the innovations and technology, you know, the things that we see in terms of, you know, just the basic things like social media or the iPad that we're filming this on or the uh, the laptop that we have in front of us or even, you know, being able to have your own portable studio within that of your home to be able to do these videos and radio teachings, you know, in that of your home. This was not done, you know, 20 years ago. True, you could say that, but at the same time, Daniel Daniel's not dealing with things that are within the secular world. One of the things that we can say, however, and this is what I think that Daniel was speaking about, is that during those days, the the revelation of Mashiach will be better understood. The revelation of Mashiach and what it is that he taught will be better understood. And will become more prominent in those days. The thing is that when we look at how it is that the, you know, the faith such as the Hebrew roots and the Messianic faith and Lapid Judaism, which I'm a part of, we, we, we look at the evolution of, of, of those things. You know, about 10, 15 years ago, two, the two house movement was huge. And then everybody abandoned it because they learned more, you know. They learned that, hey, that, that concept's not necessarily so kosher. You see the same thing with the sacred name movement. It was adopted and then quickly abandoned by most, you know, and all of that stuff, you know. So we end up seeing people kind of going through the fire, you know, going through Egypt and then coming out, you know, on the other side, kind of going through that of Tazri and Metzar and then coming out on the other uh, on the on the other end of Akharimot and Kedoshim. You know, we end up seeing that entire thing happening there. And so the 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 very same concept with this concept of Yeshua teaching Hasidus, which is being proven time and time again. It's very interesting because every every year, except for last year, I get to go to SBL and ETS, and I get to present at SBL and ETS. And these are biblical scholars from all over the world. Biblical scholars that are within that of Judaism, that are within Christianity, that are within, you know, even, you know, Islam, that are, that are they just know a lot about the, the biblical text. And the thing that's interesting is that even the Christian scholars that are, that are there will always be talking about how it is that Yeshua HaNotri and Paul as well taught Judaism, you know, and the thing about it though is that 20 years ago, this would not have been discussed over at SBL and ETS. But since that time, there's been a lot of people looking into, for instance, the works by Dr. James Dunn, the works by Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark Nanos, um, you know, as well as that of uh, E.P. Sanders and uh, the, oh, the gentleman that uh, N.T. Wright, you know, and, serv and, and several others that have, you know, propagated this idea of Paul within that of Judaism. And this was a, considered to be a new concept within the 1970s. That's why it was called the uh, new perspective on Paul, you know, which was not really new, but it was new to those who were not familiar with it. And this just kind of had a snowball effect of how it is that knowledge of the biblical text just you know started to to uh to snowball and all this so you know the thing about it though is that this this very thing that is that we're speaking about here today is something that the face that it is that i have mentioned do not discuss but we should be leaving leading the way on it we should be the ones leading the way and you know saying to our congregations we need to be doing mashiach sadua 
because of the fact that we have the Messiah, we should be the ones in charge of this. Now, at the same time, there are contemporaries of mine that have briefly spoken about this concept. They may go and mention it within like a two-minute sound clip, such as Rabbi Yeheskel Atalki. I have great respect for Rabbi Yeheskel Atalki. And Rabbi Yeheskel Atalki disagrees with me, but I want to go and give you guys, you know, I want you guys to make up your own minds here in terms of this. Now, first of all, in Luke 22, I believe that we are having, you know, the, uh, the regular Pesach Seder there in Luke 22. Okay, that's what I believe is happening there. Now, Rabbi Italki thinks that the Sedua of Mashiach, the meal of Messiah, is being done on not the eighth day of Passover, but on the first day of Passover within that of Luke chapter 22. These are discussions that are not being had. These are discussions that I think that the various communities that I have mentioned need to be having. I think that, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to say, okay, did this thing, uh, you know, even though that the Baal Shem Tov is, is, you know, said to be the first one to do Mashiach's uh, Sedua, you know, the, uh, the meal of the Messiah, um, is it possible that the Baal Shem Tov got it from a more ancient source? And if so... Why was it done on the first day or a day before Passover as opposed to an eighth day of Passover? You know, so this is, you know, the, these are conversations that you will never hear anybody talk about. These are conversations we need to be having. We need to be questioning this because obviously there is something going on and there's a difference of opinion here, but yet... There's not enough research out there that we are adequately familiar with to be able to really have the conversation. And we need to be. We definitely need to be. Because majority of you who are watching this or listening to this on the radio right now are believers in Yeshua and say, I've never heard of Mashiach's Sedua. I've never heard of this. But the thing about it, though, is that we really, really should be the most knowledgeable in this premise, not that of Chabad, not that of Breslif. We should be the ones that should be the most knowledgeable on this. We got some catching up to do, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today as we briefly discussed the concept of Mashiach Sadua right here on the Brutal Planet radio program. Make sure to go and check out our websites, lapidjudaism.com. Also, we used a lot of Hebrew here today, as we tend to do. If you want to learn Hebrew and Aramaic, you can head on over to hebrewandaramaic.com. Go and hit the sign up button over there and you can go and learn Hebrew and or Aramaic right over there for only $10 a month, $30 every quarter, or get a lifetime pass for $130. Okay, so make sure to go and check that out as well. I want to wish each and every single one of you Shalom Bracha, peace and a blessing, and we will catch you guys next week for... Parshas Acharimot, as we have our usual study. All right? So, Shalom Bracha, peace and a blessing. Shalom. So, you want to learn Hebrew or Aramaic, or maybe both? Make sure to check out HebrewandAramaic.com. All three of the instructors on the website have accredited more licenses to teach the languages that they teach on the website. You can take the lessons on your very own time, and they even have a Roku channel so you can learn from the comfort of your very own couch. With over 200 videos going step-by-step step through the languages and all the various scripts and over 100 PDFs of exercises and quizzes, this is the most thorough set of lessons that you'll find anywhere on the languages of the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. So visit HebrewAndAramaic.com today and sign up for only $15 a month.